first of all, uh, let me say um, good day to all of you, wherever you are in the world. And uh, my lecture today is going to be about optimization of strength and toughness of steel. I'll explain what uh, strength and toughness means. And I'll also try and explain what optimization means, because very often uh, when we try to control one property, many others will change. So to begin with, let me explain what strength means. Now, supposing we take the weight of an apple, then one apple weighs about one newton. Uh, newton is a unit of force, so it's perfectly acceptable to use that as a weight. If I put the apple on one square meter, then that is a stress of one pascal, and one megapascal would be one million apples on one square meter. Now, typically a steel is about 700 megapascals strong, which means you could put 700 million apples on one square meter. And today, I'll even talk about two and a half billion apples on one square meter. In other words, a steel which is two and a half gigapascals in strength. And I'll try and explain where all this strength comes from. So that is the meaning of strength, the physical meaning of strength. It's a force per unit area, and a good way to think of it is if you put an apple on one square meter, that's approximately one pascal. Now, toughness is something completely different. It is the ability of a material to um, absorb energy before fracture. So if I put a plot of stress versus strain, then the area under this curve is the energy absorbed per unit volume. And the greater the energy absorbed per unit volume before fracture happens, the tougher is your material. So uh, the standard way of measuring the toughness is to make a choppy specimen which has a V-notch on it. And when you break it, you measure the amount of energy that's absorbed. And generally speaking, you do this as a function of temperature because a steel normally becomes more brittle as you go down in temperature. So that is the meaning of toughness. Now, window glass is extremely strong. It has a very high hardness but it is extremely brittle. That means it isn't tough, because if you look at the area under the curve before it fractures, the energy absorbed is very, very small. And this is why we do not make the entire car out of glass, because if it fractured, then we would be damaged seriously because it doesn't absorb energy. So window glass is strong, but it is not tough. Steel is extremely tough because it deforms a lot before it fractures. So that is the difference between strength and toughness. What do we mean by optimization? So I'm going to talk about uh, a specific example which you are particularly interested in, and that is the pipeline. If you look at the thousands of kilometers of pipelines that have been installed in the world, people are trying to make stronger and stronger line pipe steels. And the reason for that is that you can increase the pressure of the gas that you flow through the pipeline. 15 megapascals is what you want to aim for. If the steel is stronger, then you also use less steel. And that isn't simply a question of the steel costing money. It will also weigh less. So if you are putting pipelines under the ocean, then they will necessarily bend while you're laying the pipeline and therefore you want the weight of the steel to be as small as possible. So supposing that your technical leader asks you to make a very strong steel for a pipeline, I would say that would be very easy to do if that was the only issue that we needed to worry about. But in general, when we improve one property, many others change. So just to give you an example why very high strength steels are not used for pipelines, even though they exist, here is what happens during the manufacture of the pipeline. So X65 is the conventional line pipe steel, which starts off as a flat piece of plate, 
and then it, it is bent into a U-shape. That U-shape is then turned into a circle, welded together, and expanded to make a perfect circle. This is the sort of die that you use for making the U operation, bending the plate into a U shape. If you use a stronger steel, then when it comes out of the die, it will spring back. That means the shape will no longer be this perfect U, but it will change to this as soon as it comes out of the die. So that's called elastic spring back. And what that means is that the next stage of the process cannot happen until you correct that spring back. So you might give rise to manufacturing problems when you increase the strength of the steel. And you have to bear all that in mind, that it isn't just a question of increasing the strength or toughness. There are many other variables that come into play. This is another example. Uh, in line pipes, which were made in the very old days, you could have a crack propagating along the pipe for several kilometers. And you can imagine the scale of the disaster that would happen if a pipeline fractured over a length of several kilometers. And you must have heard about the recent incidents uh, of the BP oil disasters in the Gulf of Mexico. Things get incredibly expensive when you get failures. Now, when you make a very strong steel pipe, it isn't possible to stop a crack from propagating for long distances. So what you also have to do is to reinforce the pipe with glass fiber composite at periodic intervals so that the crack can be arrested. So that's another complication which comes when you work with steels which are strong. Many of these pipelines, of course, have to be welded. Quite uh, severe conditions, for example, this is in the Arctic, you can see the ice and snow, and that welding operation is critical because if you have a failure, that would be disastrous. So if you make a high strength steel line pipe, you also have to develop the accompanying welding alloys. And if I show you a survey that I've done of all the welding alloys that are available in the world today, imagine that we want to make a pipeline which is a thousand megapascals strength you would not be able to find a welding material anywhere in the world which gets to 1,000 megapascals. So you would have to start a parallel research program in development of welding alloys. And if you're making pipelines, as Tenaris does, for going down the oil well, here is a picture that I took in uh, Tenaris in Argentina. These are the line pipes which go down an oil tube. Then there will be problems associated with hydrogen sulfide and hydrogen embrittlement and so on. And a whole research program has to be started on the resistance of these pipes to sour gas corrosion and hydrogen embrittlement. So just to summarize, uh, a real design problem will not involve just two variables. There will be many variables that you have to control. Your primary aim might be to improve the strength and toughness but you will come up against many other complications. And a good design problem will not just have a single solution, it will have many different solutions. So you might come up with many different combinations of chemical compositions of steel which have the same strength and the same toughness. And you have to specify your problem in much more detail than strength and toughness alone. So optimization, means that you look at all the variables that are important in controlling the two particular properties that you're interested in. Just to give you an example, which I'm sure all of you are familiar with, uh, at the moment when you want to listen to music, a large number of people will reach for the MP3 players. And an MP3 player is designed uh, to basically store music and to play it back to you. And there are many different kinds of MP3 players available. They all have exactly the same function of storing music and playing music. Some of them might look cute to some people. Others might be fans of Apple. Others might want a very tiny piece of kit. And some people would like something that looks like an iPod. But they all have the same function. And yet, some of them are much more popular than others because they take account of many other variables than simply looking at the storage of music 
and the playback of music. So I've summarized for you the meaning of strength, basically the ability to support large stresses, toughness, which is the ability to absorb energy before fracture, and optimization means you cannot simply focus on the two quantities that you are interested in, but you have to look at a much wider scenario in order to create a product that is successful. So let me now go on to what actually controls these properties that we are after. And in order to do that, we need to look at the structure of the seal. So this is the iron carbon phase diagram. I don't want you to worry about details. Uh, there are simply three crystal structures that we are most interested in. One is austenite, which in the vast majority of seals occurs at high temperatures uh, of the order of, say, 900 to 1,000 degrees centigrade. But that isn't stable when you cool the seal down. It changes into a different crystal structure here, which we call body-centered cubic, because the iron atom is at the middle of the cube and also at the corners of this cube. And this is the so-called ferrite, which exists in the vast majority of steels 1.3 billion tons of steel that we use today. Of course, uh, the definition of a steel that is that it contains carbon. And carbon combines with iron to form an iron carbide, which we call cementite, which has a very complicated crystal structure. It's a hard phase, and it's a brittle phase, but it's also a useful phase, as you will see later. So these are the three basic crystal structures which occur in all of the steels that you use today. Even if they are extremely low carbon steels or heavily alloyed steels, you'll find one or more of these phases in their microstructure. But we have an additional uh, bit of richness in steel, and that is that we can change from one crystal structure to another by many different atomic mechanisms. And just to illustrate to you the two key mechanisms by which I can change the arrangement of atoms from a pattern like this to another one like this. Imagine that this is your austenite, exists at 900 degrees centigrade, and that we have these square atoms and we have these round atoms, let's say iron and manganese atoms. I can change the way in which these atoms are arranged into the crystal structure of ferrite by two different mechanisms. One is that I deform this structure so that I generate a new pattern without the need for atoms to diffuse. Diffusion means an uncoordinated movement of atoms. So here, by physically deforming the crystal structure into a new pattern, we've got the crystal structure of ferrite but there is no diffusion, so you'll see that the number of square atoms here is exactly the same as the number of square atoms here. So this kind of a transformation can happen at low temperatures, and bainite, martensite, acicular ferrite, all of them, we call them displacive transformations because you achieve the change in crystal structure by a physical deformation, which has a large shear strain. Does not require diffusion, for those reactions to happen. The second way is imagine that I break all the bonds between the atoms here and I rearrange them into a different pattern while maintaining the external shape here. Okay, so you can see the shape here is exactly the same as the shape here. So for example, when water freezes into ice, it doesn't change the shape of the container. So that's because in forming the crystals of ice, the molecules have moved to create a new pattern. So they can move while maintaining the external shape. And in that process of diffusion, some atoms prefer to be in the ferrite. So you can see that we have a lot more of the square atoms on this side than on this side. So this kind of a transformation, which is, for example, perlite or ferrite, that can only happen at temperatures where atoms are mobile. And that typically means at temperatures in excess of about 600 degrees centigrade. And when these kinds of reconstructive transformation, reconstruction because we break all the bonds and rearrange them into a different pattern, 
These kinds of reconstructive transformations form the vast majority of microstructures in all the steels that you use today because they have very simple microstructures, just perlite and ferrite. Now, to summarize the key structures that occur in steels, I've got a diagram here with a little bit of detail, but you don't need to worry about the detail. You can see the two classifications, displacive transformations and reconstructive transformations. Displacive transformations, martensite is the most obvious uh, that most people are familiar with. You simply quench the steel to obtain martensite. You have bainite and acicular ferrite, uh, weedman satin ferrite. And in the case of the reconstructive transformations which require diffusion to occur, we have perlite and ferrite or lotomorphic ferrite. Now, there has been so much research done on the atomic mechanisms of transformation for all of these phases that we understand them quite well. It doesn't mean the problem is solved, but you could actually try and design steels without doing experiments using the knowledge of these atomic mechanisms. Let's see what controls the strength of these phases that steel is so rich in. Yes, steel is extremely useful because we can control the structures, we can mix them up, we can change the chemical composition, we can change the processing. But where does the strength come from? Here is a, a summary of the strength of a single phase. That means just ferrite or just cementite or just austenite. So let's begin with ferrite. This is the crystal structure of ferrite. We have an iron atom in the middle and a layer of iron atoms at the top and at the bottom. Now clearly, uh, when this layer moves over the underlying layer, it will have to go over some bumps. And that means if you have pure iron, absolutely pure iron, without any structure, that means no grain boundary, without any alloying addition, that will still have some strength because the atoms will have to slide over the layers underneath. And that is the strength of pure iron. So every single steel will have a certain amount of strength which comes simply from the crystal structure. And that strength increases as we go down in temperature. And this is one of the reasons why steel becomes brittle at low temperatures because as it gets stronger, it becomes difficult to deform it and therefore you cannot absorb energy during fracture. Of course, uh, we never use steels as pure materials, we had alloying elements. And those alloying elements will have different sizes of atoms, and therefore they also contribute to the strength of the steel. And that contribution will depend in some way on the concentration. So if I add one weight percent manganese, I might get an increase in strength of 70 megapascals. If I add one weight percent of carbon, I will get a much, much bigger increase in strength because carbon sits in the holes between the atoms and it causes a lot of distortion inside the crystal structure. So it's a very powerful strengthening mechanism. If our material contains crystals which are shaped like this, like plates, then the finer I make the plates, the stronger our steel will be because you put lots and lots of barriers in the way of plastic deformation. So the strength will vary with one upon the thickness of these crystals. If these are not plates, but they are crystals which are of the same size in all directions, then we have the classical hole patch effect where the strength will vary with one upon the square root of the crystal size. So the finer you make the crystals, the stronger your steel will be. And I'll come back to that point later on in the lecture. You might notice that there are some dark particles in this image. Those particles are precipitates of cementite. And the larger the number density of those precipitates, that means total number of particles inside a given volume, the smaller will be the spacing between those particles, and therefore they will obstruct deformation more, and therefore the strength increases as I decrease the spacing between the particles. So this is the spacing between the particles. And if I decrease the spacing, then the strength will increase. 
What you cannot see clearly here, but it's evident in the contrast that we have in this transition electron micrograph, are line defects called dislocations. And dislocations are contradictory in the sense that their presence makes a steel weaker, but if you put enough dislocations in the material, it becomes stronger. So as we increase the density of dislocations here, we will get a stronger steel. And you can increase that density either by exploiting displacive transformations or by deforming the steel and getting work hardening. So the topics that I've summarized here are for a single phase. And just to show you the contributions that they make in real life, uh, in this pie chart here, uh, there's a particular microstructure which is effectively bainite which forms on inclusions. I have a total strength of 690 megapascals. Pure iron itself contributes about 220 megapascals. The microstructure, that means the size of the crystals, contributes about another 250 megapascals. And then we have solid solution strengthening contributions from the other alloying elements which are in the steel. And this is the composition of our steel. Uh, just to show you that these contributions are not constant if you change temperature, here is a, another set of pie charts. Here I'm looking at the strength at 550 degrees centigrade and then at 600 degrees centigrade. And the size of this pie chart is proportional to the strength. So the strength collapses as I increase in temperature from 550 degrees to 600. Notice that the contribution from precipitates at 550 degrees C is very large. But it becomes very small when you get to 600 degrees centigrade because the precipitates become large and the spacing between the particles increases. And furthermore, defects can avoid the particles by diffusing over the defects. Okay? So here, the contribution from precipitates is very small compared with this. But solid solution strengthening doesn't change with temperature. So you have a large amount of solid solution strengthening. OK, so the point I'm making here is that when we calculate the strength, it is not constant as a function of temperature. And the contributions from the different components will change as we alter temperature. And that is why we hardly ever use ferritic steels at temperatures in excess of 600 degrees centigrade because the strength collapses as we raise the temperature. Now, of course, uh, so far I've considered essentially single phase microstructures. That means we have ferrite or we have perlite. If I go to mixtures of microstructures, so here we have a mixture of bainite and martensite, then the simplest thing to do is to add them up by taking the strength of bainite, multiplying by the volume fraction of bainite, adding to it the strength of martensite, multiplied by the volume fraction of martensite. So this is called a rule of mixtures. And if I plot how the strength should vary as a function of the volume fraction of bainite, I would get this straight line here. OK? Now, of course, you can see that this is not correct, because the experimental data are far away from this line. As a first approximation, it's OK, because bainite is weaker than martensite, so the strength should decrease. However, there are complications because as we form bainite, the composition of the martensite changes, which is why we get a peak in this curve instead of just a linear variation with the volume fraction. So when we come to mixtures of microstructures, we have to think a little bit more about how those mixtures interact with each other. So for example, if I make a composite of glass fiber in plastic, when I pull the composite, the plastic will deform first until it gets to a point where you can transfer stress onto the glass fiber. And similarly here, the martensite is hard, the bainite is not. So first, the bainite has to deform and transfer stress onto the martensite. Now, there has been a huge amount of work all over the world to get stronger and stronger steels. 
And I want to show you some of the limitations of the methods that are being used to optimize the strength. If I told you that in 1950, we could produce steel with a strength of 10,000 megapascals, you would be very surprised. But here is a graph. I'm showing you the tensile strength. This is 10,000 megapascals. That means the weight of 10 billion apples on one square meter. That was achieved in 1956. And you could actually go to 22,000 megapascals, theoretically. Okay. Now, one problem with this is that the strength collapses as I increase the size of my piece of steel. And the reason is that this relies on perfection for strength. That means if you make a perfect crystal of iron, it will be very strong because it doesn't contain defects. As soon as you make it larger, thermodynamics tells you that there are necessarily defects in the material, and therefore the strength collapses down to values which are, we are more familiar with. So it isn't good to try and produce strength by making your steel perfect. That means without defect. Because as soon as you make it larger, the strength will collapse. Now, I explained to you earlier that we could actually produce strength by introducing a very large number of defects. Okay, so if we deform metal very severely, then the strength will increase. So this is an example of a commercial steel, which is 5.5 gigapascals in strength, and it's produced by severely deforming iron. So just to give you an idea of how much deformation, if you take 50 grams of this material and you stretch it into two kilometers, that is the amount of deformation that you need to get to a strength of five gigapascals. But notice that it's, it's very ductile, okay? That means it can deform. If you take a carbon fiber, which has a strength of three gigapascals, it has almost zero ductility. You cannot tie a knot with a carbon fiber. Okay, so what's the problem? If we can make a steel which is 5.5 gigapascals in strength, then uh, where is the strength coming from? And also, uh, why aren't we using it uh, in large quantities? Well, first of all, the strength comes from the fact that we have severely deformed the material. Now, this is an image in which you can see individual atoms of iron. Okay, so it's a very, very high magnification. Each one of these spots and rings of atoms are single atoms. So we are looking at individual atoms of iron. And these atoms are from this steel. Now, if you notice, there are some dark lines here. Okay? And what's happened is that by severe deformation, we have made the crystal size extremely small. So this is a few hundred atoms big. So by introducing grain boundaries on a very fine scale, we have a strength of five and a half gigapascal. Let me just show you that this material is not size sensitive because we are actually gaining strength by introducing defects. So this is the original graph that I showed you from 1950, where the strength collapses as we increase the size. And this is the steel where the strength has been produced by deformation. It is not sensitive to uh, size. The problem is that if you def get strength by deformation, then you will make wires or very thin sheets. Okay? You cannot make large, big chunks of iron. So just to give you an idea of the scale of this steel wire, when we look at uh, socks, men's socks, or women's stockings, uh, their thread is measured by a unit called a denier. Right? 
and one denier is the weight in grams of nine kilometers of fiber. It's a very strange unit which is used in the textile industry. Women's stockings are about 10 denier, very fine thread, and men's socks are about 50 denier in the thread. And the steel wire that I showed you earlier is finer than the thread in women's stockings. So you cannot use this wire to make bridges. It's just too expensive to do that. You cannot use it as cable to support cable cars. It's too expensive. So although we have achieved a very high strength by deformation, it isn't a terribly useful material. It has, uh, the biggest use it has is in the cutting of semiconductors because then you waste very little of the semiconductor. And these lessons that we have learned so far have mostly been forgotten, that if you try to produce strength by introducing perfection, then your material will be very sensitive to the size of your sample. So you must have heard about carbon nanotubes. Uh, there are more papers published on carbon nanotubes than ever published on steel. And the reason is that these tubes of carbon have an incredibly high modulus and a very, uh, sorry, this is the modulus, 1.2 terapascals. So this is six times the modulus of iron. And they have an incredibly high strength, 130 gigapascals. Okay. Typical steel has a strength of one gigapascal. Now these measurements are done on carbon tubes, which are 10 to 20 nanometers in size. And having done measurements on very tiny tubes, the scientists exaggerate by saying, OK, we can make a space elevator using this material. And an elementary calculation that we teach to undergraduates is that when a defect forms in a material, there's an increase in energy, which opposes the formation of the defect. However, the introduction of a defect also increases the configurational entropy. And that favors the formation of a defect. So if you balance these two factors, every material will contain an equilibrium number of defects, which increases with the size of the material. So if you have more atoms in your material, you will have more defects. And there is absolutely nothing you can do about it. And that is why all the research on nanotubes, which claims to have a material which will have a strength of 130 gigapascals, is complete nonsense. There is no nanotube rope which is longer than two millimeters, which exceeds the strength of steel. So just to summarize, um, uh, sorry, if you try to produce strength by physical deformation, then you can only produce wires or thin sheets. If you try to produce strength in small particles which relies on perfection, then that is doomed as size increases. So these are not good methods of making engineering materials out of which you are going to make engineering structures. Now many people are not aware, but there was an absolute revolution in life as we know it around the 1960s when a process called microalloying was invented. And microalloying means introducing very small particle, uh, very small concentrations of, for example, niobium in the steel, which forms niobium carbides and stops the grains from growing. And the small concentration is as small as 0.02 weight percent. And that led to a revolution in steel technology by thermomechanical processing and a dramatic increase in the strength and toughness of steel because making the grains smaller both increases strength and the toughness. There are roughly 20 billion tons of steel which are in service throughout the world without people knowing about this. And why don't people know about this? They don't know because they are absolutely reliable. They do not fail. 
You know, if you have a Microsoft computer, you will worry about your computer system. You would want to know what is going wrong because it fails too many times. Okay? The steel doesn't do that. It's a very reliable material. There's roughly 20 billion tons of it in service. And it's good that the vast number of people don't care about it because we want it to be like that. We don't want them to worry about failure. So the question is, can we take this process further? The process works by severe deformation. So you start with grains like this, and the boundaries of these grains are pinned by fine niobium carbide. You deform it at a temperature of around 1200 degrees centigrade to get these pancake-shaped grains, and then you allow it to transform. And typically, grain sizes of 10 micrometers are nowadays routinely obtained. Um, the process works, as I said, by refinement of the austenite grain size, which is recrystallized repeatedly, and grain growth is stopped because of these very fine particles of niobium carbonitrite. And if you have fine austenite grains, you will also get fine ferrite grains. Um, why do fine grains improve strength and toughness? Okay. So here is a large grain size, and here is a small grain size, and these are our carbide particles, or they could be non-metallic inclusions. With a large grain size, because the cementite or the inclusions tend to be located at the grain boundaries, when these brittle inclusions crack, the cracks will propagate within the ferrite, and you get failure. If I make my grain size much smaller, then small particles are more difficult to crack. Okay? So I've made my grain size smaller. The particles themselves will become smaller because there are a lot more of nucleation sites. Therefore, cracks are difficult to nucleate. When they do nucleate, they will be changed in direction as they propagate through a fine grain structure. Here, there are long parts where the cleavage plane is identical. So by refining grain size, we improve both the strength and the toughness. So I want to stop there for the break. Uh, what I want you to think about is thermomechanical mechanical processing is an incredibly successful process, which no one in ordinary life is concerned about because we make such incredibly good steel that they do not fail. How far can we go in refining the grain size using thermomechanical mechanical processing? At the moment, the steel industry can happily deliver to you ferrite grain size between 10 and 20 micrometers. Can we go down to 1 micrometer? Can we go down to 0.1 micrometer? And will that signal the next revolution in strength and toughness? So I will stop now for the coffee break for 15 minutes. We are exactly on time. So if I go back to this slide, uh, my question to you before the break, uh, based, based on the fact that uh, we get an increase in strength and toughness by making the crystal size smaller. My question to you was, what is the smallest grain size we could achieve in thermal mechanical processing? Because by thermal mechanical processing, we can produce very large quantities of steel. Now, what is the problem in producing small grain sizes? Well, you introduce grain boundaries. These are the grain boundaries. And those boundaries have a certain energy per unit area, which we call sigma here, because they are defects. They're not perfect regions where atoms are arranged. And we also have a certain crystal size here, which tells us how much surface we introduce inside our material in three dimensions, surface per unit volume. So if I take the energy of a grain boundary per unit area, and multiply by how much grain surface we have per unit volume, then this is the cost that you have to pay to create small crystals. Okay? The finer you make the crystals, the greater the amount of surface, and the greater the cost of creating those small crystals. So as you go to finer and finer crystals, you will have a bigger and bigger cost to pay for getting that grain size. Now, if you re just remember this equation that 
we are multiplying the energy per unit area by the amount of surface per unit volume, and we want to increase the amount of surface per unit volume. So if I just repeat that equation here, that is the cost. Where does that come from? Well, that comes from the free energy difference between austenite and ferrite. That is the driving force which causes austenite to decompose. So if I take this and balance it with this, then I can say that as I increase the driving force, that means the undercooling at which ferrite forms, I will get a finer grain size. This is a grain size. Okay? So grain size changes inversely with the undercooling below the austenite transformation temperature. So I now have a theory which will tell me what is the finest grain size I could achieve for a particular value of the undercooling below the equilibrium transformation temperature. And if I plot this as a graph, this is the line I would get, okay? So here is the driving force where austenite and ferrite are in equilibrium. As I go below the equilibrium temperature, the free energy change increases, and I'm able to get finer and finer grain size. And this is the theoretical limit of the grain size you can get. If you want to produce a fine grain size, you have to undercool the steel until you get a large enough free energy change. This is the theoretical grain size. This is, uh, these are data I've collected from the literature on thermomechanically processed steels. And you can see that they basically stop at about one micrometer. So the steel industry is not doing a good job because we could actually go much finer in grain size. And according to this, I could even get to 0 0.01 of a micrometer. So there must be some problem as to why we are stuck at a grain size of about one micrometer. And that must be quite a serious problem uh, because there's a huge amount of money invested in thermomechanical processing. The problem is as follows, that as I increase the undercooling at which ferrite forms, heat is released in the steel. So this is a, something called recalescence. The heat of transformation actually warms up the steel. And when I take that into account, my theoretical limit actually changes to something which is more realistic here. And what it tells me is that by thermomechanical processing, as long as we want to make large quantities of steel, you are not going to be able to produce a grain size which is much finer than one micrometer, okay? So that is the reason why we are stuck at approximately one micrometer as a fine grain size when it comes to bulk production of large quantities of steel. So just to summarize, thermomechanical processing is limited by recalescence. That means the heat of transformation actually heats up the steel so that we are not actually undercooling below the equilibrium temperature. If you put a thermocouple on the steel, you will see the temperature actually rise as the material tries to cool because the heat of transformation can't be dissipated fast enough. So to get to a finer grain size, we need to store that heat of transformation inside the material. Okay, now how do we do that? Uh, I'll explain to you shortly. Of course, if we reduce the rate of transformation, that also helps because the heat has time to diffuse away. But it's clear that we need to transform at a low temperature to get a very fine grain size. Now, just like carbon nanotubes, there's a huge amount of research which has been done to produce nanocrystalline steel. And most of that research has not been successful. Okay? So millions and millions of pounds have been spent to produce nanostructured steel, and it hasn't been successful. Uh, the aim, of course, is to produce strength and toughness, a co good combination of strength and toughness. Now, the reason why it hasn't been successful is that as you make your grain size smaller and smaller, you're introducing more boundaries inside your material. Those boundaries have a lower density than the rest of the material, rest of the crystal. So defects like dislocations sink inside the boundary. So you're left with regions which are completely free from dislocation. So here is how the volume fraction of a grain boundary increases 
as you reduce the grain size. So if you know, 0.1 of the volume of your material consists of grain boundary, then you are going to have defect-free crystals. That in turn means that there is no work hardening mechanism. Okay, because without defect, you don't have a work hardening mechanism. If you eliminate the work hardening mechanism, then you will have plastic instability, and as soon as you pull your tensile specimen and it yields, it will fracture. So here is an illustration of what happens. Here is for a large grain size of 13 micrometers. As I go down to 0.21 of a micrometer, my steel basically gives up and fractures. Okay, so you completely lose ductility because there is no mechanism for work hardening. So in addition to making the crystal size smaller, we have to introduce some mechanism for work hardening. Because if you do not do that, then you get a plastic instability and your material will fracture at a low elongation. Now how do you do that, okay? Uh, first, first of all, um, let me just summarize the things that we need to do to produce a successful nanocrystalline material. We need to introduce a work hardening capacity because without that, you will get plastic instabilities. We need to store the heat of transformation inside the material. Uh, we must reduce the rate of transformation because that allows time for that heat to dissipate. And transforming at a low temperature is always a good thing because it reduces the scale of the structure. Let me go to this point here, which is how do we store heat? You remember this slide where I categorized the different transformations into displacive and reconstructive. These are closer to equilibrium because diffusion occurs. Here diffusion is not allowed. So you change the crystal structure by deforming the austenite into the structure of the ferrite. That deformation is real. If I take a crystal of austenite and polish it completely flat, and then allow it to form martensite or bainite, you will see with your own eyes the deformation. And here it is. This is an atomic force microscope image of a crystal of austenite which was transformed to bainite. And you can see that there are huge deformations here. Okay. These deformations are physical deformations which cause a lot of elastic strain energy. So that elastic strain energy is stored inside the material. It's very large. If you store that inside the material, then you do not dissipate, uh, you do not create heat which needs to be dissipated. So these transformations have very, very little recalescence as we had in the normal thermomechanical processing. So this is a good way is to exploit displacive transformations to store heat. This is actually bainite here, which has caused these shear deformations. If I summarize about 30 years of work on the mechanism of the bainite transformation, then it's very, very simple. It, all, all good theories are very very simple. Okay, so imagine that bainite forms exactly like martensite, that there is no diffusion at all. The carbon is trapped inside the bainitic ferrite. But you are forming it at a high temperature, so the carbon then escapes into the remaining austenite and then it precipitates as cementite. So this is the classical structure of upper bainite. Now this phase is not good. It's cementite, it's a brittle phase, and if you have a very strong steel, uh, you know, we're talking about, say, 2,000, giga, uh, 2000 megapascals, then even cementite particles are not good. But fortunately, we can stop the reaction here, okay? If we add silicon to our steel, then silicon stops the precipitation of cementite from austenite, so we are left with beautiful plates of bainitic ferrite and carbon-enriched retained austenite, and that austenite is extremely cheap to produce because you are using carbon, okay? You're not using very expensive nickel and elements of that sort to stabilize the austenite. What we are doing is we have a low average carbon concentration, 
but the carbon is redistributed into the austenite and it stabilizes the austenite. So you produce a nice microstructure which has only two phases, both of which are ductile, the bainitic ferrite and carbon enriched retained austenite. If, you, if I show you an optical micrograph of what that micrograph, where you see bainite in all kinds of directions and the white regions there, the light etching regions, uh, are the retained austenite. Now, this looks ordinary, but the next picture that I'm going to show you, you should take a deep breath because it's a fantastic picture and it's a transmission electron micrograph of this structure. Okay, so take a deep breath. You may not ever have seen this micrograph before. The scale over here, this is 200 angstrom, okay? And here I have a carbon nanotube at the same magnification. We have produced crystals of ferrite which are finer than carbon nanotubes purely by phase transformation. There is no deformation needed, no rapid cooling needed. It's a very cheap steel because we are stabilizing the austenite here using carbon. These crystals are 20 to 40 nanometers in thickness, and you can produce large quantities of steel, large in all dimensions, having this crystal structure. This is the world's first bulk nanocrystalline material, and the austenite has the job of adding a work hardening capacity. So this steel is strong, it's about two and a half gigapascals in strength. It is tough, about 45 megapascal root meters, and it has ductility, I'll talk about ductility shortly. And it's a very, very simple structure. Incredibly fine crystals of bainite in a matrix of carbon-enriched austenite. So this, is, this has been produced at the lowest temperature ever for bainite, about 200 degrees centigrade, a fine microstructure which is finer than carbon nanotubes, extremely hard, 700 vickers, there are no carbides, and these are the properties. Now, let me show you uh, since this lecture is about strength and toughness, and ductility is vaguely related to toughness, here you can see the ductility and the strength. So here we have an elongation of 27% when I form that structure by transforming at 300 degrees centigrade, and approximately 11% when we transform at 200 degrees centigrade. But the tensile tests themselves are at room temperature. So my question is, why do we have more ductility at 300 degrees centigrade transformation than at 200 degrees centigrade transformation? And I will show you some uh, further data which are puzzling, that why do we have such a large variation in ductility depending on transformation conditions? Because all, in order to design steels, you, you need to have a good understanding of what's going on. Now, one of the clues on why this happens comes from a neutron diffraction experiment in which we pull the material inside a reactor so that we can follow the changes in phase fractions as we pull it. Because the austenite will be mechanically unstable, it will decompose to martensite at a work hardening capacity. This is a tensile test which is done in a reactor with neutron diffraction, and you can follow how the fraction of austenite changes as a function of plastic strain. And we repeated these tests for many, many samples. And fracture always happens when the austenite content reaches about 10%. Okay? Now, why is that? What is so magical about 10%? So I'm going to explain a long story in a very simple way. So imagine that the blue color is the austenite, and the white color is the ferrite. In this, I have sufficient blue material to continuously draw a line through the austenite. Okay? So we say that the fraction of austenite is greater than the percolation threshold. That means you can continually deform through the austenite. On the other hand, 
as defamation proceeds, the amount of austenite will decrease, and eventually we will not be able to draw a continuous line through the structure. So here is the red austenite now has lost percolation because there's no way I can draw a continuous line through the austenite. So then you are stressing the less ductile phases, okay? And fracture happens. When we do a calculation, we find that the percolation threshold, that means the point where you can no longer have continuity through the austenite, is about 10% of austenite. Now with that knowledge, you can go on to design a steel for the ductility that you want. If you want greater ductility, you've got to increase the amount of austenite you have in your material. If, if you can tolerate less ductility, and there are many applications where 10% ductility is enough, then you adjust your austenite content and optimize the strength instead. Okay? So this is a game that we have to play to optimize strength, toughness, and many other properties. I want to show you uh, how, with Tenaris, we have developed a, a steel technology for pipes which go down oil wells. And this is actually a patent application from the work that Gonzalo's and Teresa Perez, Gonzalo Gomez and Teresa Perez and uh, us in Cambridge did together. This is a patent application for a high strength steel application, pipes going down oil wells. And it's based on exactly the kind of structure that I've shown you already. That means uh, a mixture of bainitic ferrite and austenite, but with one uh, difference is that we don't need this level of strength. This is something like two and a half gigapascals in strength. We need a lower value of strength, about 1600 megapascals, and we need a greater toughness than 45 me uh, megapascal root meters. So how did we do this? Well, we first need to understand what controls toughness, okay? Because the Chappie requirements for such pipes are very severe. And of course, then you have to also be able to tolerate hydrogen and hydrogen sulfide and all the horrible things that happen down in an oil well. Okay, so just to remind you again, the mechanism of the bainite transformation, that the transformation happens exactly like martensite, but the carbon then escapes into the remaining austenite. And we stop the reaction at this point by introducing either silicon or other elements that we know will stop the precipitation of cementite. Now, when we do that, we end up with a mixture of beautiful plates of bainitic ferrite and retained austenite. But this is not an equilibrium mechanism of transformation. The implication of this from thermodynamics is that bainite will stop forming when the carbon concentration of the austenite reaches a particular value called the T0 value, okay? So I don't want you to worry about the details about the T0 value. I'll illustrate what that means. <clears throat> Just like we have a phase diagram, I'm plotting temperature versus the carbon concentration. And this is the T0 curve, which defines the concentration of carbon in the austenite where the reaction to bainite must stop, okay? So I can calculate the volume fraction of bainite that I can form by taking this distance and dividing it by this distance, where here is the average carbon concentration of the steel, and this is calculated thermodynamically, and this gives me the volume fraction of bainitic ferrite. I cannot do anything to exceed this volume fraction. Okay? But if I look at that equation, there are possibilities. If I reduce the carbon concentration here, then I will get an increase in the volume fraction of bainite. If I can manipulate this curve by adding other alloying elements, so that I increase the T0 curve to larger concentrations, I can also increase the volume fraction of bainite. But to get a structure which is so beautiful, with just plates of bainitic ferrite and nice thin films of austenite, is very easy. To get the right properties, it's not. And I will explain to you how we did this for the OCTG pipes. So let's imagine that by calculation, we work out the T0 curve, 
and we design three seals. Okay. Uh, this is a 0.4 carbon steel, two silicon. Silicon is the same, it's to stop the cement type precipitation. Here we have three manganese. This is a 0.2 carbon, two silicon, three manganese. So all I've done here is I've reduced the average carbon concentration by a factor of two. So that's this value. If I reduce this, then I can increase this. And this seal is the same as the first one, but manganese is replaced by nickel, and that has the effect of shifting the T0 curve to larger concentrations. Okay. Now, why am I bothered about increasing the fraction of bainite? Well, if I take the first steel here, 0.4 carbon, 3 manganese, 2 silicon, the toughness is terrible. This is 100 degrees centigrade for the impact transition temperature. There is nobody in their right mind who would use this steel for a critical application such as a pipe going down an oil well. You really want this curve to go down to much lower temperatures so that you can get good Sharpie values at low temperatures. But my fundamental question is why do we have this poor toughness even though the microstructure is so nice? Yeah? So we have a grain size here which is effectively a quarter of a micrometer. We have the films of austenite which are ductile then why are we getting such poor toughness? Well, it's actually that T0 curve. If you look at the structure here, we have the bainite, but we also have this very large region of austenite. And it doesn't matter how long I transform it, I will not get more bainite because the T0 curve limits the amount of bainite that can form. So with that particular steel, I have the problem that there are large amounts of austenite which are mechanically unstable and transform into large regions of brittle martensite and we get poor toughness. So even though this microstructure is very fine, this is not. Okay? And that's like putting a brick into the microstructure which is the size of 50 micrometers. That's no good. Now one way is if I reduce the average carbon concentration to 0.2, and the other way is if I can, by alloying, shift the T0 curve to larger concentrations. So this is the bad steel, and this is the T0 curve by substituting nickel for manganese. If I do that, I get rid of the large islands of austenite. This beautiful microstructure without the large islands. This is the steel where I've reduced the carbon concentration by a factor of two. These are the austenite films and bainite. There's no coarse regions of austenite. And here we have shifted the T0 curve to a higher carbon concentration by removing the manganese and putting in the nickel. When you do that, okay, so very, very simple theory to guide this principle. You get a shift in the impact transition temperature of almost 200 degrees centigrade. Okay? So we haven't done a very large number of empirical experiments but we use the basic theory to get rid of the problem, and you can see large values of Sharpie at very low temperatures. Okay. Now, of course, we don't want to make a steel with 4% nickel because I'm told by Tenaris that 4% nickel is too expensive. But using exactly the same method and the cooling conditions in Tenaris in Argentina, we designed the steel for which we have applied for a patent. And th this is another example. These are rail steels, completely different requirements where we want rolling contact fatigue and wear resistance, but really based on exactly the same structure as I illustrated. Now, with this, we ran up against a problem that when we started to manufacture rails which are small, there was no difficulty, perfectly happy, as soon as the process was scaled up to large, the rails started to fracture. Okay? This is even without being put into service. They would fracture while they were being stored. And the reason is that displacive transformations are confined within the austenite grains in which they nucleate. Diffusional transformations <coughs> can cross the boundaries of austenite and destroy them which means that you cannot segregate impurities to the austenite grain boundaries. Here, 
even after you form bainite and martensite, you still have the prior austenite grain boundaries where impurities, such as phosphorus in particular, can segregate. And they cause fracture. As you can see here, these are austenite grains exposed by phosphorus segregation. Now, of course, uh, I could say, okay, let's remove the phosphorus from the steel. But a steel producer will tell me that if I want to make large quantities, that's an impractical idea because it's expensive to remove phosphorus. We have known for almost 60 years that if we add about a quarter weight percent of molybdenum, that stops this embrittlement. Okay? The mechanism by which it stops is complicated, but it works. So simply by adding a quarter weight percent of molybdenum, the problem was solved. And supposing any of you actually travel between the United Kingdom and France, then there's a tunnel under the sea which connects the two countries. And these rails are made out of that sort of bainitic steel. Okay? So they are very reliable, they have good rolling contact fatigue resistance, and they have very good wear properties. So by using simple theory, combined with some experiments, so very critically designed experiments, it's possible to optimize a variety of phenomena, but it is never the case that you only think about strength and toughness. In the case of the rails, you have to think about rolling contact fatigue and wear. In the case of the OCTG pipes, you need to worry about hydrogen sulfide and hydrogen effects. In the case of line pipe, you've got to weld them. Line pipe for oil and gas transmission, they've got to be weldable. You've got to have a mechanism which arrests cracks if you make a very strong steel. If I'm applying this concept to automobiles, then formability becomes important. So it's never the case that you simply optimize strength and toughness. Now I want to finish off by showing you a, a very large resource that we have created, which contains much more information than I can deliver in this lecture, which you can download completely freely. Okay? And this is available for you at this particular website. And we have slides, slide presentations. We have actual videos of lectures, which you can download. So you can find anything from thermodynamics, kinetics, to microstructure, neural networks, many, many topics. You can download complete lecture videos, uh, PDF files of the lecture notes, complete textbooks. So for example, if you want to learn about Bainite, you can download uh, an entire textbook. You can find movies of large bridges being constructed, or aircraft engines, and how steel technology features in it. There's a story, for example, about the tallest building in the world, and I was able to take pictures and photographs while it was actually being constructed. Many, many resources here, so you have no excuse. If you want to learn, it's all there on this website. So that is my last slide, and I thank you all very much for listening.